Good evening and welcome to Artist Talk and Art. Tonight we feature uh, a legacy rebroadcast of a program that was originally held and recorded in February of 2003, so roughly speaking uh, 20 years ago, uh, which was uh, during the same period of time of the College Art Association, which was in New York that year, that, that they move around the country. Um, it's a program of Native American artists uh, moderated by Nadima Egard, also a Native American. Uh, we thought you would find that interesting. Uh, this comes from uh, over a thousand recordings that we have, a thousand events that we have held and recorded that are now in the hands of the Archives of American Art of the Smithsonian. And uh, we periodically pull things out of that archive. This is an example of that. Uh, I'm Doug Shear, president of Artist Talk and Art. And I wanted to mention that um, 2024 will mark our 50th anniversary. And we're planning uh, quite a few interesting things for, for that. Most of them centered in May of 2024, including a gala and an auction uh, and just a number of interesting things. And if you would like to learn more about that, we'll certainly be doing quite a bit of promotion for both of those things uh, and some projects. But in general, if you would like to donate art to the auction or you would like to attend the event, uh, any interest that you have, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you'll find, uh, you can contact me. Uh, you'll find my contact at the bottom of the uh, emails, or of course, on the website. And now I'd like to turn it over to Maruna to to run the uh, tonight's uh, recording from 2003 on Native American art and uh, spirituality. Particularly welcome to, I know there are a lot of people here with CAA passes on, badges on. Uh, it's delightful that you made it down here. I hope that when you came down, you perhaps came a little earlier and went through some of the galleries, but I know it's busy up there. I was there earlier today. Um, let me mention that there is this red flyer in the front. If you didn't pick one up before, take one with you. Uh, we are on the web at www.atoa.ws very easy to find us. We have an extensive archive of videos and audios. We've been around for 28 years. We're the longest running panel series in the history of art. Uh, we're proud of that. But we're gypsies. We just moved here uh, three weeks ago after being in Soho for most of that previous time. Next week's panel is called Museums and Alternative Spaces Less Traveled By. And the, the heart of that panel is to focus attention on small and alternative spaces that don't normally get a lot of attention. And on that panel are uh, Meredith McNeil, who's the Associate Director of the Rotunda Gallery out in Brooklyn, Tom Finkelpearl, the Director of the Queens Museum of Art, and Kathleen Laziza, Executive Director of the Micro Museum. That's next week here. Tonight's panel uh, is interesting to me in a couple of ways, not the least of which is, as I told Nadima, uh, we have had Native American panels several times in the past, but it's been a long time, probably close to a decade, since we did the last one. So we're delighted to have one happening tonight, and tonight's panel is called Native American Art and Spiritual Aesthetics. Uh, I'll just introduce Nadima Egard, who is going to introduce the, the other members of the panel. Nadima Egard is uh, an, a Columbia University trained uh, teacher, art educator. art educator, with a master's from Columbia, and uh, is based in New York City. And um, is a Cherokee, Lakota, and Powhatan uh, and director of the Red Earth Studios 
uh, which she'll tell you a little bit about. Uh, there is a show that is on through tomorrow at the American Indian Community House, if you're not aware of this show. Um, this is the card for the show, and perhaps at the, at the end of the evening, if you come up to the front, Nadima can tell you a little bit more about the show. The Native American, the American Indian Community House is located on Broadway, 708 Broadway, on the second floor. That's the location of the gallery. So that show is on until the end of tomorrow. And now I'll introduce Nadima Agard. Thank you, Doug. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I just want to make a little correction about the title. It's a question. It wasn't printed that way on the original um, brochure, so we had these uh, one-page flyers made with a few corrections. It's Native American Art and Spiritual Aesthetics. And um, I'm very um, pleased today to have on this panel some really wonderful people, great individuals, people I've known for many years, but beyond that, that they're, they're really wonderful artists. And um, to my far left is Lorenzo Clayton, a New York-based um, area, um, New York area based Navajo printmaker, lithographer, and painter who earned a BFA degree from Cooper Union in New York where he is presently um, teaching also. Uh, the extraordinary caliber of his work was recognized by the uh, Idlejorg Museum where he received a fellowship in 1999 for, uh, as part of the Native American Arts Fellowship program that they have there. His work was also included in a show that recently took place at the Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian called Who Stole the Teepee? And that's down in Bowling Green. Um, it's pretty recent, but it, you know, it's a couple of years. Anyway, um, and the um, next person I want to introduce is Pena Bonita, an Apache Seminole, New York-based artist who has a master's degree from Hunter College here in New York, and Penn is an artist with an amazing, diverse range in, ex in experience and, and is, um, is uh, experienced in printmaking, photography, and costume design. Her work was recently in a show that I curated called Who, uh, Who is the Virgin of Guadalupe? Women Artists Crossing Borders. Um, Alan Michelson um, is also a New York-based artist who's Mohawk. He has a, a BFA from Tufts University and is and is a recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Visual Arts Fellowship. And his work was, a, a, he did a remarkable installation uh, as part of the whole Who Stole the TP exhibit at the Smithsonian. Kay Walking Stick, Cherokee painter, earned her BFA degree from Beaver College in Pennsylvania and her M MFA degree from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Uh, her work's also included in Who Stole the TP. And her work is both an abstract and innovative uh, representational image of earth iconography. She's an in outstanding and innovative painter who has been an inspiration to myself and many other artists and art professionals in the native world and the greater art world. And she teaches at Cornell University in Ithaca, but she is now on a leave. Um, so the question that was presented for the um, for this panel is a, is a counter point for those who do and those who don't and, and those who do both. And you know, the answer is in the question. So it's not always the way what you say, it's the way you say it. And it's not always the way you make art, but it's why you make art. So traditionally, there are no words for art in native societies. So that, um, so that which is Western society has defined as art has been for many Native Americans a spiritual language that is an extra connected with our perceptions and interpretations of the cosmos. And um, so a few years back, there was a, a publication um, that um, included an essay by Evan Maurer. And he described Native American art as visual, visual metaphor for a spiritual attitude. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I ran across that today. Um, so um, the, 
The beaded bandolier bags of the Great Lakes Ojibwe and the parfleches of the Northern Plains Lakota have decorative qualities, but certainly are not just art. The bags communicate coded information, and the parfleches are recordings of cosmic truths that encapsulate terrestrial and celestial reciprocity. So now let me find my other piece of paper that's underneath the, the microphone, okay. I was trained in the Western tradition, but became increasingly more attracted to the arts of my traditional indigenous people as a vocabulary, a visual vocabulary for my own work. And in that process, I discovered that traditional indigenous people make art for very different reasons than the way that I was trained to make art. It began at a very early age, and when I felt that my most deep-seated expressions were suppressed, I totally thought it was unique at the time and that these expressions were of my own doing, but realized in time and with wisdom that I was expressing a higher truth, passed on by my DNA, perhaps, but it was a truth that was more familiar than universal, and perhaps both simultaneously. Using Western context or technique, I create content that refers to a spiritual aesthetics employed traditionally by Native American women of the Northern Plains. In the same manner, I am inspired to create work that I believe has a spiritual nature and is inspired through me, but not from me. In this contemporary time, many of the Native American artists may or may not employ these Western uh, aesthetics solely, while others may or may not employ uh, or, may, or may employ both. Some, some people employ the Western aesthetic, some people don't, some people employ both. I consider myself a person who employs both. And I would say most uh, contemporary Native American artists somehow ha have some influence of Western aesthetics. I'm not trying to say that we're the only people who have spiritual aesthetics. What I'm trying to say is that I'm speaking about what I know and have chosen to speak about something that is specifically related to the history of my Lakota people because the women employed a visual language that dealt with a very esoteric subject of the spiritual nature. So um, I'm going to show a few of my slides at this point, but before I do that, I want to um, share this, um, this video clip. It's, um, it's from... Um, a video called The Gift of Double Woman. And um, she was a divine entity, a divinity, a feminine divine entity who came to the Lakota women and gave them the gift of quill work. So I just want to share that uh, little clip with you because it kind of sets the precedence for what we'll continue to talk about. out of the past. There were those who told of double women who brought the art of porcupine quilling to Lakota women from the spirit world. Some said she sang from rocky cliffs, luring women to her teepee. But no one ever saw her except in dreams. They said when tan robes were left at her teepee, they were returned with fine quill designs. Some called her deer woman and said her footprints turned to deer tracks where she walked.
Others said she was an enchantress, and no man was equal to her spell. Someone is meeting me here. He is the one, says the old song. said she was a crazy woman who laughed uncontrollably and did the work of men. But all said that she was Waka, 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 sacred, sacred. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I had a conversation with Alice Lee Holy Blue Lakes, which is one of the women that does traditional quilt work. Um, and she came to New York in 1987 to do an artist in residency at the, Nash at the Museum of the American Indian. And we were having a conversation, and I felt that uh, I wasn't a very traditional person because I was trained in Western uh, style of painting. And she told me that uh, before there were any kind of traditional arts, there was the, f the first art that women did were earth paintings. And these earth paintings were done on these rawhide containers. And um, she talked about how um, these, these were very esoteric symbols. And um, recently, there have been some studies in Lakota and Stellar um, theology and one of the uh, publications that came out of Sintagleshka uh, University talks about the uh, symbolism on the, the, the hard flesh. And um, it was really interesting because um, a lot of the designs are like um, diamond designs and um, X designs, they're diagonal, they're, they're not representational. The representational painting was done by the men and the women basically recorded this, this very cosmic information, um, and um, they talk about the reciprocity of heaven and earth, and that this, this symbol that's on the par flesh represents heaven and earth. And it was really interesting because I've been uh, very inspired lately by uh, images of the um, earth mother, goddess, the Native American goddess uh, Tonan Singh, also known as the Virgin of Guadalupe, also known um, possibly as the white buffalo calf woman. There are many correlations between the two of them. And uh, the Lakota people say that white buffalo calf woman can speak any language. And so she appeared, white buffalo calf woman appeared at the center of North America, and the Guadalupe Tonan Singh appeared at the central very center of the Americas. And so um, in working with images of the sacred feminine, which is an area that I, I work in, um, I felt in a way that, in my own way, that I was working in the same way in terms of creating this, um, this visual prayer, which is also part of our Lakota tradition, um, and, um, and a way of uh, coding work. So a lot of our, our lot of our work as artists and as indigenous people is very coded. And I think that I even want to code this presentation because um, <laughs> we're being videotaped. But um, I would like to uh, start showing you some of the slides so I can explain um, what I've been doing. And I need to get up and walk over the Cape Cod Dragon, huh? Okay, I don't know if that's focused enough. This is a piece that I did, um, and it's at, it's right now on exhibit in, at the uh, show that we mentioned earlier at the gallery, which is closing tomorrow. It's called the Aztec Virgin Mother, and it represents the Earth Mother from the indigenous perspective, and I tried to stay away from religious connotations, so we'll stay away from that. But. Uh, the interpretation of this, this um, 
feminine divine icon is represented in the four directions, which is really very strongly a part of our, our, um, our way of thinking. And, um, and each direction represents an aspect of that earth mother goddess, the jaguar, uh, the rattlesnake, the butterfly, and the hummingbird are all aspects of the goddess, and they all represent a symbolic personality of the goddess. Obviously, the jaguar is the fierce side, and, and perhaps the butterfly is the transformational quality of the goddess. And, um, and then we have the rattlesnake, which incidentally is a really important, um, has provided a lot of symbolism uh, for many peoples of Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica into the southeastern United States. In 1987, I did a, I got a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts and I traveled to the southeastern United States and it was a real gift because I got to meet all these traditional artists. And in, in doing so, I got to see all this work and then eventually went to Mexico and, and saw lots of parallels. Um, so um, this represents that image and then the colors that I chose were specifically colors that are associated with specific um, specific ideas or um, it's really hard to explain in words but it, 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 the choice of color wasn't necessarily my choice um, and that's what I mean about spiritual aesthetics is sometimes we don't choose the thing and like someone said to me well you're not Mexican and you're not Catholic and and why did you choose to use that image and I said I didn't choose to use it it chose me and so I've been working with this divine feminine image and uh, the next slide will show it as a transformational box and that is a quality that as indigenous people we have a, a, an ability to be transformational, to, to absorb things at, without having those things change us, and to transform in, in a way that we can survive who we are. So the next slide is... Um, uh, this is um, not ceramic, it's um, canvas. It's soft sculpture and canvas and mixed media. And here is the... Um, the piece as a box. The next slide is a piece I did a uh, retablo for Frida Kahlo who I was real interested in her life as, an, as a person who is an artist and who's, who is a person who is deeply connected with her indigenous roots and um, this particular piece I chose to do for her as a retablo or um, sort of a prayer or a sacred kind of offering and in that respect that she is now in the next world and that she's at peace. And I used the color Azul Anil, which was a color she painted her home. But it also happens to be a sacred blue that's used in various cultural and spiritual and sacred art. Ex uh, for example, in, in Tibet, the Tonkas are painted that color. And in, in Hinduism, the gods are that color. So it's a, it's a sacred blue. And in Africa, it's a very important and protective color also. Next slide. And here's an, uh, uh, a slide of the image that's flattened. Next slide. And this piece is called Prairie Parflesh, and it's inspired by those rawhide um, paintings, those earth paintings that are done on rawhide, um, which represent heaven and earth, and the reciprocal relationship of heaven and earth, and the ba and that idea of balance of 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 the energies that are male and female. Next slide. And this is another piece that I I've worked on uh, with the uh, parflesh imagery, and also the symbol of the uh, the female symbol of birth, the yoni. Next slide. This is a piece that I did called Star Blanket Heaven. It was inspired by an actual event. Uh, I was driving down um, the Lewis and Clark Trail, actually, when I worked on the reservation in 1995 to 1997 as repatriation director. And um, I used to drive every morning at the, before I got up, before the dawn. And by the time I was on the highway, the, 
the, you know, the sun was coming up. And um, the, that particular day, buffalo were walking um, single file over a snow bluff. It was really inspiring. And this particular symbol, the morning star, is a real sacred symbol for the Lakota people. And I can only sum it up, sum it up by saying it's a visual prayer. That not all our prayers are, are verbal prayers, that some of them are visuals, visual prayers. And I have my own particular take on what I think it means, but it represents the, the um, it represents peace and understanding. And it rises in the east, it hits the herald of the, of the dawn, and actually it's the, it's the planet v Venus, who we know is the goddess anyway. So um, this was kind of um, a fusion of something that was happening in time, something that's eternal, and something that's temporal. Next slide. And then this is a piece that I did for a, a collaboration of women of color in the arts. And it's a buffalo skull, which is a sacred altar to the Lakota people. And um, in a lot of my work, I use it as a metaphor for the uterus. And, and the next slide shows it as part of, the, of the, the whole piece that was on exhibit at the Studio Museum in Harlem, 1997. Next piece, next slide. And this is... Um, there's a couple, this is a male piece and then there's a female piece. And in our tradition, there's a great uh, reciprocity of male and female and the balance of those things. And you're constantly being ta taught that and aware of that. And in this, this piece, it rep uh, represents the birth of a male child. And in the Lakota tr tradition, when a baby is born, the umbilical cord is put into a, a, a birth amulet. So. Um, here we have the, the male piece, and then the next one is the female. And there are also boxes uh, which transform into cubes, uh, more like cubes than boxes, but, uh, but this one is the female plate. And the, the first one, the male one, is birth, and this one is conception. And obviously one is more phallic and one is more fe you know, feminine in, in, in imagery. Next. And there's a whole bunch of symbolism that goes with that, but you know, we're, we're kind of, I want to be courteous to our, my panelists. And this one is called Grandmother Moon and her Corn Moon Daughters. And it represents the four sacred colors of corn that was given to us as a gift. Um, am amongst the Hopi people, there's a story about the Creator giving us four sacred colors of corn. And incidentally, they, for me, they represent the four sacred directions and the four colors of humanity. At this point, I'm going to like cut my uh, talk short because I really feel that we, we want to have time for the others. So I'm going to make this my last slide, and then our next talk uh, speaker will be Lorenzo Clayton. He's not showing I'm not showing sure. sure. An artist without slides, though, Lord. You gotta listen to me now. Okay. Native American aesthetics and uh, spirituality. Does it or does it not influence my work? Spirituality, uh, of course, I guess we're all involved. Um, Native American aesthetics, absolutely. Um, I guess simply because I, I can ex uh, briefly explain that. And I was brought up on Tohajile, my Navajo reservation out in New Mexico outside of Albuquerque, and uh, you know, left there at an early age. Um, found myself in New York at some point in the early 70s. Uh, always loved abstraction, continue to love it, and that's what. Um, yeah, it heavily influenced my mode of thinking. Uh, I would ask myself, why do I like abstraction so much? And I think a couple of years ago, the answer finally dawned on me, in, in that I began to realize that um, Native American, indigenous, you know, aboriginal um, modes of thinking in terms of you know, cult, cult, culturally based are all seems to em embrace abstraction, 
you know, they take life out of context and content and they embrace it uh, just in the way they live life. And I thought, well, that's why. That's one reason why I'm, I'm so drawn to abstraction. Uh, okay, so um, what am I doing now? Um, let's see. I am working on several projects. Uh, I'm involved, uh, I'll be involved in um, an installation piece in 2004 that deals with um, uh, mathematical equations that describe human emotions. Um, it, it, I mean, it's, it's simply that. Uh, and um, working on a piece that um, <clears throat> um, a friend of mine and I will be also an installation slash performance piece that we're going to be um, describing describing and freezing molecular structure uh, within an instant. And it's a kind of natural phenomena that uh, takes place from something that we're all very, very familiar with. Uh, and I'm not going to say exactly what that is because you, you, know, you really have to be present uh, to really appreciate the impact that, you know, your mind will, that will occur. And uh, uh, working on another uh, project uh, that I've been working on for seven years now, and it'll probably take another ten years to complete, and it's, you know, rather complicated, and it just involves, um, it involves um, systems of thought, uh, you know, religious, uh, religions, four religions that have uh, influenced the world. Abor yeah, obviously indigenous, Christianity, Buddhism, and Islamism, um, or the Islamic uh, religion. And it's really, it's, 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 a, it's a project that uh, involves, um, that describes uh, mythological in, um, events uh, throughout the religions, uh, historical events, and an ongoing spiritual quest uh, that we now experience. And so it's just a way of tying in uh, these these four these four influences. Mm, you know, it's um, it's a project that involves. Uh, Three-dimensional uh, paintings, uh, full sculpture. Um, you know, don't have slides of it. No. Just in the in the works. Yeah. That's that's the that's the crux of what I've been up to. Thank you, Lorenzo. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we probably will look forward to what you're doing, Lorenzo, and perhaps we can have a panel where you'll be um, talking about your work in the future. I hope that we'll, this will be the beginning of perhaps a series of panels of Native artists talking about art. Um, well, let's see. The next person I want to introduce is Pena Bonita. I thought they must have had a hell of a tornado around here somewhere. <laughs> um, I guess some of you are aware that you are really surrounded by Indians. You should be very afraid. <laughs> you should be very afraid. I am. <laughs> um, 
This is some work that I've been doing in collaboration with a friend of mine. Um, among Native Americans, being gay is not considered uh, something that's um, to be put down or to be uh, ostracized. And the friend of mine who I'm doing this work with is someone who is um, not expected to live too much longer because of HIV AIDS problems. Next. It's a series uh, on the gay male. And so if you don't mind, just flip through these fairly fast. Okay. They're all figurative. They're all done more or less realistic, and it's acrylic. You know, you're okay. hiding some of your shadow. Well, this is where they told me to stand. Okay, next. <laughs> okay. Um, some of you will recognize, we're going to go through some his history here. Um, a long time ago, I'm into photography. My uncle used to do photography on the res, and I got into it as a very young kid. And when I started to do in photography, I was not quite satisfied with just doing just photography. I had to either draw on the photograph or I had to um, manipulate it in some way, and that's never stopped. Um, my photography will always uh, lead somewhere else. Um, so on the slides, I did some abstract stuff. Um, next. This is, um, I come from the Southwest, New Mexico. Um, my mother's an Oklahoma Indian and my father's from New Mexico and they met during World War II. And I was raised in New Mexico, so uh, most of my landscape stuff is from uh, New Mexico. Next. Um, one of the things that used to impress me was how things like tractor tires and all kinds of strange things like potholes covers always wind up with Indian designs on them. So I kind of use that. Okay. Next. Um, this is a piece that I did for a show um, it, where, I, where I raised, we used to go to different areas for celebrations or for uh, get-togethers and went great, great distances and didn't think much about it. And uh, as a kid, my, my family was always going from either New Mexico to Oklahoma or back and forth. And we had copper mines that cropped up in the area. And when I left New Mexico and I would get letters from home constantly, was always every letter had something about somebody dying. Somebody died in the copper mine or somebody died from a lung disease caused by breathing the copper mine tailings. And so uh, one of the pieces that I did was about copper. And this, was, this is about nine foot by 14 feet. And it's now at the Long Island Un University collection has this. Okay, next. Uh, this was a show that was me as a blonde. Okay, um, some of may, may remember me being turquoise head and violent head and all kinds of stuff. Um, this was at Lincoln Center. Um, this is manipulations of photography again. And I'll show you some more of that next. Sorry. Next. Okay. Uh, next. Sorry. Okay, that's, this is one of the pieces of photography that has been manipulated with painting on the photograph. Okay, next. Uh, then is, this is, um, in Canada, this girl is an Aleutian. Um, and she was a photographer. They belonged to the NEPA group. It's Native American in Photography. It's a, a Canadian-based organization that used to have lots of uh, some of the people in this room. We used to get together in Canada and show each other photography and talk about how do we get our photography in the mainstream and, and how do we manipulate uh, 
the organizations to support us and she was one of the girls that came from Alaska and she was shooting this gun with her camera so I shot her. Okay, next. Uh, this was a series that I did on um, old Pueblos that were falling down. And there was, um, at one time, a lot of people run into New Mexico to buy up land. And there was a ruins area that was really getting desecrated by people going there. And the petroglyphs that were ages and ages old were getting ruined. And the, all the old structures were being ruined. And they were saying things like, well, you know, they're not worth anything. They don't really need any upkeep. And Indian people really get upset about things like this. And uh, so I did a series called Give It Back to the Indians. This was paint on photography. Next. Um, I did a series on the iron workers of New York. Um, Indian men have been iron workers and have done construction work in New York City from about the time that the uh, 34th Street uh, structure went up. What's the name of that building? Empire State Building, um, and uh, wanted to pay homage to many of them that um, gave their lives and ha are still in working in this trade. Okay, next. This is more of that. It was uh, painting on top of photography. Next. Uh, this was a, a, you have to have a sense of humor to be an artist, you really do. And one of the things that I like to do is find commonalities um, among the tribes and sh that we do share not only with people of this continent but of the South Americans too. And that is one of the things is old cars. Every Indian reservation has its share of old cars that <coughs> You get started going somewhere and they break down. So I did um, a series of 101 photographs based on a car that broke down. Next. Um, these are paintings on top of the pieces of photography. Okay, next. Okay, it's the same thing. Next. I just did a variation of this over and over and over and over. Because every time you got in one of these old cars, you got out in the middle of nowhere, and they broke down. Next. Okay. You see the six pack? <laughs> right. Next. Okay. Next. Okay. Next. And next. Okay. Next. When this was um, mounted, every show I had it in, it was funny because people would come into the gallery, and usually people walk around the gallery and they're kind of quiet and they kind of like talk in their little tiny groups. But when they came to this piece, it was like, hello, everybody got in a good mood and started talking and there was a lot of laughing going on. And I, I, I really appreciated that. Thank you. Next. <laughs> Next. Uh, this was also uh, in celebration of old pickups. Um, I write poetry, and I've done poetry about old pickups, and old pickups have been just a part of life from day one. It's one of the things that I learned to drive on. Okay, next. This was called Are You a Real Indian? Okay, next. And this is the old, old canoe. Next. And this is a sort of recent, the thing was that I've started doing photography of people who are uh, using modern technology but are still doing old time things. This boy was cooking um, corn soup but was on 
the cell phone. And uh, he was calling one of the elders to get the recipe exactly right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, that's all the slides I brought with me, but currently I am working on a project from uh, the tribes in Mexico where um, I went down to Chiapas and the tribes down there still speak their native languages and uh, are very, very closed in terms of allowing people to come in and f photograph them. Um, I was very lucky that I was invited to come in and to photograph and uh, was given extensive uh, time and uh, really made to feel like they felt like it was a, a fine thing that I was doing. And um, it's a series that I'll be working on for quite a while. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Penna. And I think our next, our next person that's going to speak is Alan Michelson. He's the serious one amongst us. <laughs> Prepared with notes. Maybe I'll take your seat. Maybe two heads in the way. Um, can we have the first slide and the? Yeah, slide. You need the lights. Maybe I can. I can't pull it back a little. Um, and you've got the spotlight on you. You have to stand in the spot. Because I could just pull this back a little. I'd rather not stand in front of my work. <laughs> Is that, am I still in? I apologize for these notes, but this is the, the second panel I've done in 24 hours. I think, I think, I think you can see actually. No? appreciate it. I have a deal with my paintings. I won't stand in front of them if they don't stand in front of me. Um, the question, uh, is there a spiritual aesthetic in Native American art? I had to go to the dictionary on this one to look up aesthetic. It's one of those words I've never been comfortable with or really understood. And the dictionary, and the dictionary only makes things worse sometimes. It's actually from the Greek aesthetikos, um, which means of sense perception. And it became an English word in 1798. Sometimes the sudden appearance of something, a word, a concept, may actually be an announcement of its disappearance. The first part of the first definition of my Webster's is of, relating to, or dealing with aesthetics or the beautiful. The second, artistic. The third, pleasing in appearance attractive. The second definition is appreciative of, responsive to, or serious about the beautiful. Also, responsive to, or appreciative of, what is pleasurable to the senses. Based on these definitions, maybe we should be asking if there is an aesthetic in Western art, or maybe even Western culture, and if there ever really was. I've been interested in shorelines lately, I did a recent panorama project involving a local creek, which I have some slides of to show you a little bit later. I retraced the water route the first European colonists took to reach Maspeth, their first settlement in Queens in 1642. They clashed with the Lenape community there violently, resulting in the abandonment of the settlement in 1644. However, the Lenape were soon forced out. 
I was in London last spring to see the place on the Thames where the Virginia Company launched their expedition from and retraced by boat a portion of their route out of London. I tried to imagine what the coast of what we now call Virginia looked like to them, what the Palatins looked like. If we use that second definition of aesthetic, appreciative of, responsive to, or zealous about the beautiful, also responsive to or appreciative of what is pleasurable to the senses, then I really wonder if the English had an aesthetic, or the Spanish or the Dutch for that matter. Maybe they didn't have one until 1798, when they noticed that they didn't have one. <laughs> I can't imagine anything more beautiful than that coast and those palatins in 1607, unless it was other stretches of coast, other Indian people. And I can't imagine anything less responsive to and appreciative of beauty than what the Europeans did to those coasts and to those people, our ancestors, in the blink of an eye. And I not for beauty, but for something else, for spoil maybe, or for capture. The eye for capture is probably not the eye for beauty. The eye that isolates beauty from the continuum may be the eye that can't see it, because it is potentially everywhere and probably was for our ancestors. It was not an unusual thing, beauty, not something separate and precious, something rare like gold to be hoarded. It was in the eye and heart of the beholder and in the eyes and heart of the beheld. There wasn't one eye, but many eyes seeing one another. There wasn't just a person looking at something, there was that something looking back. Sometimes I think that art is a substitute, an image of something captured or destroyed. I'm very nearsighted, I'm the only person in my Mohawk family who wears glasses. When I was in college, someone lent me a book called The Bates Method by Dr. Bates, who had a theory about myopia, which is nearsightedness. He had observed that the healthy eye is in constant movement, tiny imperceptible movements, that it doesn't really focus statically on anything, but sort of scans it constantly flitting around. According to his theory, the myopic eye doesn't move. It tries to fix on the object, capture it, in order, and in order to do so, in order to do this, it tenses the tiny muscles around the eye, squeezing the eyeball out of shape so that the image focuses in the wrong place and is distorted. If his theory is true, then art may be a sight capture of some kind, a myopia, a fixing and holding on, a break in the flow. It may be a necessary holding on, a necessary capture when the field, when the continuum is no longer beautiful. I understood myself to be a painter at one time. This is one of my abstract paintings when I was just out of art school. Um, I, was, I also understood myself to be someone who appreciated nature, loved nature, and loved painting, especially painting of nature, um, paintings like landscapes. And I understood myself at one time to be someone who was an abstract painter inspired by landscapes. Next slide, please. So I, I sort of taught myself, um, uh, I actually left abstraction, I sort of crossed the line into representation because uh, a lot was going on for me at that time. Among other things, I understood myself, I didn't understand myself to be a Mohawk person. Um, I am one of uh, many in my generation who were separated from our families and culture. Um, something that a friend once called a sort of silent genocide of our people. But um, once I realized who I was, uh, it really changed, the whole, changed my whole perspective on what I was doing as an artist. And I found that I needed another language or more languages in which to express the sort of things that I was interested in. Next slide, please. Um, I, was trying to, um, I was trying to sort of merge more than one language. One language is, was the language of sort of Western representational painting and landscape painting. Another language was maybe just the language of objects, of wax, or of uh, twigs and leaves that I found on a site, maybe a site that I had been painting a landscape, feathers, sand, the stuff of the world. 
so the images, even though they're integrated into these works, um, are also sort of sitting on top in a way. Um, it's sort of the mud and the glow. That's how, I, that's how I think of it, the mud and the light. And they're two different languages, or they can be. And I was trying to find ways of combining them. Next slide, please. Just a, it's just a, that's probably about how big it was. Um, so I was sort of self-consciously moving through all this iconography, um, American iconography, stuff that was, uh, for me, derived from the Hudson River School and the painters that went west with the survey expeditions. Um, next, next slide, please. I was also interested in, um, in things that, um, I don't know, things that, I guess, I, I, iconic images like this buffalo. Uh, next slide, please. Or these, these, um, these birds. Uh, next one, please. Um, these were getting more and more sculptural. Um, and I was finding it difficult to sort of stay in the f on the frame, stay in on the wall, uh, stay in this sort of window that painting ends up being somehow all the time. Next slide, please. Um, I was finding things like a bar stool, a broken bar stool on the street, and collaging birch bark onto it, and then again painting an image, something again sitting in something that. The, the two languages um, duking it out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in 1987, uh, I was invited by Jimmy Durham to be in a show called We the People at Artist Space. Um, actually, Penna was in that, that show as well. And um, it, was, it was a big show for me, a lot of firsts. It was the first time I had done, it's actually, a, 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 I think, possibly a first for that sort of contemporary native art show in, in New York City, um, at least at a space sort of like artist space. And, um, but for me, it was, it was several firsts. Uh, I made my first installation. I suspended objects for the first time. I used electric light as a medium for the first time. I made things for the walls and the floor for the first time. Um, next slide, please. I, I ended up painting on a Hudson's Bay blanket. Um, and next, next slide, please. Um, and had these sort of mounds, several mounds on the floor. This one was lit from within and had these, had these bottles in it. Next one, please. I also uh, started used text for the first time in a piece, and I was conscious of it being sort of a maybe a history lesson. It was the first, I was looking at the fur trade, I was looking at exchange. The piece is called Up Biblum God, which is the, um, the translation of the Bible into the Massachusetts language, the original <laughs> Massachusetts language. Next slide, please. Um, that piece actually carried me to, um, to Banff, which is a big Canadian sort of nexus and crossroads. And um, I spent some time there. I'd been living in Boston and started visiting. It was, you know, it's a gorgeous place, an alpine sort of resort in the Canadian Rockies that's surrounded by, you know, just miles and miles of the most beautiful, uh, fairly pristine sort of landscape, um, dramatic Rocky Mountain sort of stuff. And I heard about this place called the Paint Pots that wasn't too far away. and I drove there with a friend, and the paint pots turned out to be these pure ochre pools where the local native people had gotten paint, had made paint from. Next slide, please. Um, the local non-native people found out about it and also started making their paint there and left behind um, the, the remains of their, uh, their paint operation. In fact, the last load is still sitting there from maybe the 1920s. I was really interested in, in this sort of landscape, not just the romantic landscape, and tried to find a way of making work about it. Next slide, please. I, I just uh, scooped up some of the ochre, which was in the, 
sort of form of mud and just put it in this box so it was like a cake, you know, just sort of like frosting in there. It made its own landscape as it dried out. And then I made paint out of the, the ochre and, and painted from that, that scene on the, of the, um, the old paint factory. Next slide, please. My, um, my approach toward painting uh, animals changed too. In Banff, I was seeing that, um, that this was all a park, that they knew where every bear was, that what was, um, what was being advertised as sort of the last unspoiled wilderness was, was you know, um, was not, and there were these poor road kills everywhere. Um, and I started, I started actually bringing them home um, and, and drawing them. I, I tried to print one once that had been run over by it. You, you never know how f flat something isn't when you try to put it through a printing, printing press. <laughs> So a little bit of Jackson Pollock in there. So, um, next slide, please. So I, I was meeting um, I was meeting people who were a lot smarter than I was in Banff and had all sorts of uh, conceptual projects that I was learning from, and I was seeing that there was a way to um, to approach this from a completely different perspective. Next slide, please. <laughs> Um, I was also realizing that um, there were other ways of painting uh, and that painting could be sort of an intervention rather than a sort of additive. There must be another one. Most of these were painted when um, people were taken to Washington to sign treaties. Um, and they were often, you know, specially asked to put on their regalia or their most traditional outfits um, and were painted. Uh, the collection was in the pro was a property of the War Department in those days. Um, and they usually had the person's name, but I realized that there was something like this came out as a print series too, a print portfolio. There was something a lot like the Audubon's project, the Birds of America, which came out at the same time. Um, the same sort of feathers and exotic animal quality to it. Um, and maybe a similar means of, of capturing the image. Um, Audubon used to hunt his birds and then prop them up in lifelike poses to paint them. Um, so I was interested in this whole, this whole sort of thing, and I just wondered what would happen if you actually took out the features, whether the portrait would collapse or not. Um, and in this one, um, there was a self-portrait uh, that that the um, the man had. He was wearing himself his own his own face paint. So I I brought try to bring that forward and and something another intervention. This is Sequoia, sort of Moses-like, carrying the. Uh, the famous Cherokee uh, alphabet that he, that he, um, a friend of mine, I asked a friend of mine who could actually uh, speak Cherokee, how you would say sort of get lost. <laughs> so, 
he, he wrote that out on there for me. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, you can, sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize I had these. Next one, please. Next one. Yeah, and we, I had it made into a big banner. I was in a show um, with uh, Jimmy Durham in Madrid and uh, London in 1992, a, a, bi a biennial, where we did a, a, a performance and a whole series of things. Next slide, please. Um, I came back to New York, <laughs> and uh, I, had a, I had a project to do with a public art fund and a whole lot different understanding of, of landscape that would that would happen in this project. Uh, I was interested in a site. Next, next uh, slide, please. Um, this is uh, that's the Civil Court Building downtown, just below Canal Street, Center Street, and Lafayette Streets over here. This is the site of a of a former pond in uh, in Colum well in <laughs> for thousands of years until about 1811 when they filled it in. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a map where you can see the um, you can see the the previous landscape superimposed on the city grid, or perhaps the other way around, I should say. And that's the red square is sort of where we were in that photograph. But this was called the Kolk by the Dutch, or the Kolk by the English. It was a freshwater, deep freshwater pond, spring-fed. The springs that feed it are still there. They're being used to cool the criminal courts building's air conditioning system. Next slide, please. I did this sort of monument um, piece uh, on that site um, in the shape of the former pond. And I, was, uh, I had a residency out in Staten Island where there was a live pond. And I cast, um, I cast the sort of shores of that live pond along with a few other things to bring out the sort of, to talk about the collect and its disappearance. Next slide, please. I called this piece Earth's Eye. And it had a, Earth's Eye was taken from Walden. Um, Thoreau wrote um, a nice line about about the pond being like Earth's eye. Um, next slide, please. So these were all separate castings, um, all in this wedge shape that had, um, that had a legend going around the outside. Next slide, please. Um, this, was, uh, this was Snug Harbor Cultural Center, former Sailors Snug Harbor, um, an 1830 uh, home for aged and uh, injured sailors on Staten Island. Uh, uh, actually, the the result of the philanthropy of this man, um, Randall, who was a um, privateer and who had made a lot of money um, preying on British shipping during the American Revolution. He left his farm in Washington Square to be used as a, a home for sailors. Uh, by the time his family stopped fighting over the will, it was 1830, the land was too valuable to use that way. They started building the you know, Washington Square, sort of um, you know, Russell Square-like park and, um, and houses around it. But anyways, next slide. Um, this is, this is um, a hyphen. That's a sort of a covered passageway between two buildings. This was the old main hall and the dining hall. And I did an installation in the windows of this passageway. Um, next slide. Um, I was conscious during my time there that this had been a home for people with, um, with uh, I, I'm, I'm being told that I guess I'm, I'm out of time. Yeah. Um, um, anyways, well, if that's the case, then I'd like to go ahead, because um, I want to show you this. I want to talk about this one piece. You can keep going. Don't look at any of this. <laughs> See, I have no concept of time anymore after all these panels. I apologize. I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to divorce that. <laughs> This is the piece that was at. Um, am I allowed to say that? This is the piece that was at the uh, 
at the who's, who stole the well, you can see who stole the TP show. Um, I made about 300 corn husk dolls, and there was a soundtrack of the Ganon yoke um, that was a collaboration with the Faith Keeper at Six Nations. Next slide, please. No, this was at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. What used to be called the Customs House downtown. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, this is the piece that I was telling you about, um, the one where I'd sailed up this urban creek. And um, I made a panorama. Actually, it was based on a 19th century form called the moving panorama, which was almost like it, it prefigured cinema in a lot of ways. Um, it consisted of uh, a tall canvas. Um, sometimes they claim miles of canvas uh, on which was painted, let's say, the, the banks of a, of a river. So there might be a moving panorama called uh, the Mississippi, or a journey down the Mississippi. And this was very popular, especially in America in the 1840s and 50s. And um, uh, it represented a certain sort of worldview, I think and a certain sort of desire for the virtual, a desire to be comfortable and sort of look at the exotic. So I took, um, I took this trip, a uh, three mile trip uh, down Newtown Creek, uh, which was called by the Lenape uh, Mespot, uh, bad water place. Next, um, next slide. I wanted to see how it looked, you know, 350 years later. And, um, and I projected it onto, um, a scrim of, of white turkey feathers that I that I sewed, and um, there's a whole story in in that and, and how that came to be. But um, some other time. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, this is a great aigrette, and um, uh, sh her nest is is actually in the upper reaches of this creek, which is a heroic thing in itself, and. Um, uh, I surpri we surprised each other uh, one time when I was sort of scouting the location and she showed up in the, um, this is toward the end of the video tape when, uh, the, toward, toward, toward the source of the, of the creek where um, it's a little bit more starting to come back, I guess. Next slide, please. This is just a, a, a closer, closer up thing. So you can see it's actually, in the end it's sort of full circle, in the end it's sort of a painting, and in the end maybe it's, um, it's a lot like where I was starting out um, with the, maybe with the glow and the, and the stuff, but um, that's all there's time for. It. Thank you. I'm looking for the hook. Anyway, our next, um, our next speaker is, and then of course the last but not but, you know, we always save the best for last, so. Um, so, here we have her. Kay walking step. Why don't I just go on here this way? Take your seat. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Isn't that a nice painting? That's not my painting. <laughs> I was, have been thinking about this idea of spirituality for the last week or so, trying to figure out how to talk about it. Uh, because, you know, I think we all sound like airheads if we talk about spirituality. Um, there is... There's a, a sense that the intellectuals of New York uh, really think we're flabby-brained if we talk about spirituality. Um, in the 60s, or thereabouts, it was okay to talk about or, or to think of yourself as spiritual. It was, in fact, kind of cool. But to think of yourself as religious or to talk about religious was very uncool. And I think that that still is sort of in force. I think we still sort of think of it as kind of
kind of cool. Unless, of course, as I said, you're a New York intellectual. It's kind of cool to talk about spirituality. But it, it has a lot of pitfalls. Um, the first, of course, is the flabby brainness the problem. And the second is that there is this stereotype that all Native people are spiritual. And all of their art is spiritual. Well, it is true that Native people do have um, a history of great religions that train them to walk with God, but so does every other cultural group on the planet. So that I really think that there is this a problem in talking about Native people, those of us here, um, as spiritual artists or using a spiritual aesthetic. Is our spiritual aesthetic any more spiritual than anyone else's? I really don't know. Uh, in 1989 or thereabouts, I came to realize that this painting, um, this painting of the dead Christ, represented to me a notion that had been taught to me as a child, that we are the corporeal, but we are also the incorporeal. Now, of course, as a kid, I really didn't know what anyone was talking about, but it was obvious to me when I saw this man A that he knew that somehow Christ is here becoming incorporeal. And when I saw this painting in this way, and I'd probably seen it a hundred times before that, of course, it permitted me to think about my own work in a slightly different way. I was working on paintings that had to do with the passing of time. Um, the uh, water, the cascades representing the uncontrollable passage of time, and the abstraction representing that which was stable or eternal. Next time. There's no way that I can see this. I hope you can see it. So I did a series of slides about the waterfalls. I was living then in Ithaca, New York, so that there's a lot of waterfalls there. Next slide, please. And the abstract part was certainly representing the eternal. But what I realized, and I'd seen that Manet, I realized that there was a corporeality and an incorporeality that I was dealing with. The visual, the um, immediate reality that we deal with every day, and the reality beyond this reality. An eternal reality, if you will. So that these paintings were, for me, about this recognition of this truth that I've learned as a child. So I continued in this vein with other paintings. Um, this is called um, the Four Directions Spirit Vision, I believe. I did a whole series with similar names, so I get them all mixed up. It doesn't really matter a whole lot, I don't think. The four direction symbol that you see is a, uh, a really one of the few pan-Indian uh, symbols that I know of. Uh, native people, uh, there are something like 350 different languages in this country that are active today. There were probably many more uh, before the Colombian invasion. Uh, so that we're very different. I mean, different languages imply different cultures and different thought patterns and different all sorts of things. But there, there are things that we have in common. And this honoring the earth through the four directions is one of them. Next. 
this has uh, this is called remnant of cataclysm took me a while to come up with that name just now <laughs> brain is slowing down <laughs> next this is a drawing here's another piece that uses the four directions symbols and as I said I think that these all have to do with that corporeal and incorporeal and when I I first started working uh, with diptychs, and this is not a true diptych, of course, but when I first started working with the diptychs, my notions about the diptychs were quite different. They were actually changed. Um, my husband passed away very suddenly, and I, of course that change is the way you think about everything. Uh, but I saw that painting, that Manet painting, shortly thereafter, and the my whole view of what was going on in my paintings altered very much. This has um, the four direction symbol in two places. I don't know if you can see it on this side. It's rather hidden. This piece is actually has a home in Venice, Italy, which I think is very nice for the painting. <laughs> this piece uh, is Havasu, Arizona. And I was using uh, copper, and this is um, like sculpt metal. It's actually Bondo. It's, they use it on cars to fix the, the bumps, you know, when it gets a hole in it or something. Um, so it's this very different kind of surface, so that the implication is that the, this other reality is different from this reality. But certainly as beautiful, uh, certainly as um, full, but both realities have beauty. These, this painting is relatively recent. It belongs to uh, the Munson William Proctor Institute in Utica. Um, I think it uh, was done about three years ago. It's called Dane in Arizona. And I had spent quite a bit of time in Italy. Thank you, God. You know? Uh, I spent a lot of time, and I have been very affected by the churches there and the use of gold leaf. And the gold leaf in those churches and in those wonderful um, 13, 12th, 13th, 14th century paintings, the gold usually indicates um, a heavenly space. It's not our real space. It's another space. It's a heavenly space. So I think that in my paintings, this gold represents that. It happens to be gorgeous also. So you know, there's, there's, that's perfectly good reason to use something, I think. And this is a meditating figure. Um, while in Ithaca, I, I actually meditated a lot. I belong to a meditation group there. And uh, it's a very Ithaca thing to do. Uh, Ithaca and um, Boulder, Colorado, and Ann Arbor, Michigan, you know, <laughs> very similar towns. We all meditate a lot. But <laughs> This is, so, next one. The, this is, um, I'm not sure this has much to do with spirituality. <laughs> you know, I, I tried to figure out what the, the spiritual really means to me. And it's, it's very, very hard to define. And I actually think that what I think of as spiritual is the Holy Spirit being within me and projecting from me. And I don't mean just the Holy Spirit in a Christian sense. I mean it in a much broader sense of that universal energy, that, um, that spirit that is beyond us, that eternal spirit that is within us. And I th certainly think that dancing is part of that wonderful eternal energy. Next. So I did a whole series of dancing figures. And the truth is, I didn't think about all these things when I was doing the, the, the paintings. 
uh, that's um, the mountains are from um, northern Italy. It's uh, outside of uh, Fieta in the um, the Prealpi is what it's called. And you'll notice the, the golden sky behind the Alps. More dancing figures. At one point, um, I don't know when, I realized that the the mountains were really a stand-in for my own body. Uh, and when you see it that way, these take on a whole other meaning. At least I think. The, I'm going to end with some paintings that I did in 1976-77. You know, all the paintings that I've shown you certainly do have a, um, perhaps, perhaps a sense of the spiritual, at least spiritual idea. It is not, they are not paintings of the transcendent. When you think of the paintings of the transcendent, you think of Mark Rothko, right? Or someone like that. Abstraction. Because abstraction does have that quality of transcendence. You know that um, Torrance, when he wrote his book about the parflesh, bags that the women painted. He said the women painted them because the women are closer to the cosmos. I've always loved that. But they have a transcendent quality, right? They transcend this momentary uh, existence. And I think abstraction has that power. And I think probably the most transcendent paintings I ever did were this, was this series of pieces um, called um, uh, homage to Chief Joseph. It was a, the Chief Joseph series. I did 36 variants on this two uh, small arcs, two large arcs in a rectangle with a painted frame. They are 20 inches high and 15 inches wide and they are usually sh shown in groups of five or so. Um, I've always wanted to show the entire group together. I'm going to have an opportunity to do that. The National Museum of the American Indian, the old customs house downtown at Bowling Green, is going to have a show of my uh, work. And I'm going to get a chance to show all of these pieces together as a big installation on one wall. So I'm very pleased about that. The whole show will be um, a show about seeking Chief Joseph. Um, it'll be, abs uh, be these abstractions as well as paintings of parflesh bags combined with landscape. Um, at any rate, for me, these pieces are the transcendent ones. These are the ones that hold some kind of spiritual aesthetic, even though I'm still not sure what that means. Thank you. I must say, Lorenzo has to uh, run off uh, a little bit early, so Got we'll to have to say to catch, so catch his bus. And, but are, are, are there any people here from the Bronx? No. Oh, well, that's good. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. I must say, if my, my sister-in-law is from the Bronx and she would be here, she'd say, but not for nothing, Dima, but you got a good-looking panel. <laughs> I must say, not only are we good-looking, but we're smart. So um, now at this point, uh, you're welcome to make comments, ask questions. We have until about uh, 10 o'clock. Is it all? Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, ask people who are asking questions to please stand up and uh, we'd like you on the videotape so that you can be asking your question and into the microphone so it will be recorded. Is 
note, leave that one for the panelists and take a stand on the presentation. I, I prefer to sit, but I speak okay. quite loudly. Wait, no, you want to record. Recording. Okay, but I have a question. Um, what, one of the things that I so noticed... Wait, one more thing, my That's right. Like this. This is such a simple question. Um, one of the things that I noticed, I think, in at least three of your work is um, um, that there, there, there's a consistent pattern of having two things that are at least visually unrelated but are put together. And, I, and as I was watching this, uh, the slides, I kept thinking, well, there are these two things that keep emerging in these paintings um, and sculptures. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to comment on that. I mean, it was particularly strong in your work, Kay. Mine is intentionally diptychs, that's why. Right, but I guess it seemed, no, I understand that, but, to, but it seemed to me like there was an, I don't know, like it was a whole, even though it was two separate things. Well, and I noticed point. it in Alex's, no, I, but. That, that, that I want it to be a whole. Take two disparate ideas, two disparate styles, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. Right. And make a whole of that. Are you familiar with Lucy Lepard's book? Yes. Mixed Blessings? Yes. There's a long, uh, uh, essay on this whole idea of artists of uh, mixed blood who use uh, diptych formats. And it's certainly not intentionally that way, but um, I thought it was interesting that she handled it that way. Well, and, and actually, and I w as I was looking at it, I wasn't thinking of the Lucy Lepard essay, but I was wondering what your origin had to do with the fact that that was the kind of vocabulary that I was seeing. And maybe I've been going to too many panels and I'm overthinking things. Um, but I just was struck by that, seeing that in, um, in three of your work. And the other question I had got answered, I wondered why this cruciform, which what I was calling a crucifix shape, uh, uh, was that kept appearing. And now I understand that it's, it's a, a, an expression of some other a different thing than what I would know. The reason that I use it is not just that it is a traditional native shape. I mean, the mm -hmm. four directions is a you know traditional scene in the rugs and everything, uh, but that it also uh, directly um, uh, applies to Christianity, and it also is a plus shape. This, there is more here. So that it has a lot of levels of meaning to, um, t to have meaning for uh, a wide audience. And I think that we all make art not just for Native people, we make it for everyone. My art is about the human condition. Uh, so that it's important that I use symbology that has to do with a wide range of people. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Some of us need to be enlightened uh, uh, um, about who Chief Joseph was and how these arcs that you represent represent a symbolism connected to Chief Joseph. And additional information might be helpful about the what the four directions you just showed us, maybe I missed it somehow, what that represents in Native American culture. The um, two aspects, the... Um, I'll start with Chief Joseph. Thank you. Please, whatever. Chief Joseph was a, a great American. Uh, he's a... Nez Perce, who um, tried to leave, he, he was forced to leave the Wallawa uh, mountains and valley uh, with his people, and he crossed Idaho from Oregon, uh, across the Bitterroot Mountains into Montana. Um, went through Montana toward Canada, and um, he had 11 battles with the uh, United States Cavalry. There was 350 Nez Perce and 2,000 uh, uh, soldiers. 
he actually beat the pants off him three times, and he, he had a um, he lost one battle and he tied one. So <laughs> he had a real good score, but he finally surrendered. And it was a very tragic story and a very uh, touching story. And he's certainly one of the most brilliant people that have lived in the United States. And uh, so that this is an honor, this man. The arcs are simply arcs. What was the other question? More about the, uh, the four directions. The four directions, the north, east, south, and west. <laughs> I, I just thought that they had, they had to do with perhaps the earth and the sky and humanity and some sort of. Well, I think it certainly is about the, the honoring the earth. In my work, um, the four directions is a, is, um, is a symbol for the, the terrestrial, and it represents the four directions, which is space. Mm -hmm. And we are children of space and time. So space is represented by the, f the number four, and three is represented by the, represents time. Mm -hmm. So we know that we are children of space and time. So that is, is a, a, you know, a visual, sort of uh, image that's very profound and uh, when you think about the two numbers and you, and you add them they make seven and if you multiply them they make twelve and if you're a student of numerology you can have a real party but um, there is, it, I use it in my work and obviously my, my pieces it, I started painting those crosses and, and, and I just they just took over and then my actual canvases became the crosses but it's a really um, it's a real important symbol, and, and for me, it represents the the earth and space. They're not crucifixes. Crucifixes are high and has a lot. Is the, this the, is the, like the equal? And also, like in Young talks about this, like intellectual. Uh, you know, it's a mind. They're just not crucifixes. They're not so crucifixes at all. The mind. They're, they, they're not crucifixes at all. If you've ever noticed in, in Western tradition that crucifixes of Northern Europe resemble, to me they resemble swords. Mm -hmm. And the crucifixes in Southern Europe, the, the Greek churches are, are the, the crucifixes have the equal distance. Also the Celtic crosses are, are right. like a four direction, yeah. Yeah, but then of course they, they were tribal people and they were in touch with those things. Um, so. I've noticed that, and I've seen, um, you know, the collections of the, the, the papal collection, and they've had those kinds of crosses. But it was really noted to me that they kind of resemble swords. They're male crosses, and the, and, and the ones that are equal distant are the female ones, in my, my visual vocabulary. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I'd just like to say you're all wonderful. All of you. Thank you. It was so wonderful to see you. I'd There's love someone. to see your work more. There's someone back from Kansas. Yes, is there any way we can find out more about individual shows for each of you where you'll be uh, exhibiting or, you know, um, where else we can see your work? Um. Well, as I said, um, my work's on exhibit at the gallery at the American Indian Community House until tomorrow. Um, if you'd like to see my work there, it's, that's the last day of the show. If you want to be on a mailing list, um, I'm sure that if you leave your name and address, Doug will share that with uh, all of us. And I'll make sure all the panelists get the names and addresses of all the people that, who would like to be on our mailing list for, on the list for shows. You can see my work right now at the, um, the Armory on Park Avenue. There's a uh, Armory show. June Kelly carries my work, and she has a booth at the Armory. So that you can go see a couple of paintings of mine right now, if you wish. I think it closes Monday. Did you have a question? I'm going to be in a show in, um, in Germany, in Frankfurt in May. And, um, I'm also going to have a one-person show at the Woodland Cultural Center uh, in Brantford, Ontario, uh, right near Six Nations. Uh, 
uh, later this year. And currently, I have a show in London. So, mm -hmm. about to go. <laughs> <laughs> other countries appreciate the natives more than we do. <laughs> okay. Question? Um, there was mention earlier about the question why we do art. I, I, I'm an artist, and I feel that the I've I've just recently moved here from the Pacific Northwest where I lived on an Indian reservation and um, I've been somewhat dismayed and discouraged by the emphasis on selling and showing and getting up there rather than on the origins of art which I feel you'll share that the origins of art being from spirit, whatever that means, from from the earth, from not from the wish to excel or expose or win favor or um, gain prestige or fame. Not that those aren't all welcome, <laughs> but um, I'd like to ask you to address those um, inner urges you have and the, and and maybe. Uh, disclose some of the emotions or the feelings that overcome you in the process of your making your work. And I, I was very um, moved and excited by everything that I've seen, and I appreciate it. Well, I don't want to shatter anything, but um, I wouldn't want to shatter anybody's illusions, but. Uh, I definitely want to sell my work. <laughs> I have a lot of rent. And um, I have a lot of responsibilities, and it costs a lot of money to make art. So if I don't sell it, I can't buy the supplies to make any more. I'm in the same position. I don't need to denigrate that. You know, and that's where it's at. But, but, but perhaps it's not the only reason we're making the art. Well, you make art because you have to. Right. Thank you. Is there another question? Would you mind passing back? Yeah, I couldn't. I'm done. Oh. I, I've got a question. Um, I work at the National Museum of the American Indian, and, and one of the things um, I've noticed is people wanting to sec se separate some of the objects into sacred and profane. and. And I don't think we separate things quite that way. And um, I think it's more integrated in our in our psyche. Like, you know, art didn't used to be, as my mom said, it didn't used to be a category. I mean, things were beautiful, but they were functional. And they were made with, with such precision and such, um, you know, the salts and things at, at, at the research branch are, you know, can, any brancusi couldn't stand up to them, but they're not going to be considered fine art. But that doesn't mean necessarily that's our category. So just because it's not a Western category for sacred doesn't mean that spirituality wasn't fused within everything that, that we do. It's just more of a comment. Well, early on, you know, I said earlier that I was trained in the Western tradition. I went to school in Europe, and I went to all the great art museums of Europe. But there was something for me that was missing, you know. There was technique, there was um, material, there was composition. But for me, um, I had to come back home to who I was as an Indian person and, re you know, relearn um, who I was as an Indian person and, and then to kind of take those two worlds and bring them together because that's who I am, you know. I'm, I'm a person who, who has uh, lived in New York all my life, pretty much, except for seven years where I lived out, you know, out west on the reservation in, in northern Minnesota. Um, but I had to, you know, I just, there was something missing for me. It just, it, and, and, and it still is, I mean. When I go to great art museums, I appreciate it, but it just doesn't touch my, it, it doesn't get inside of my gut. And it doesn't have that power that 
is going, I, I think when you look at the work that a Native people are doing today, it's some of the most powerful work. Um, I, I mean, I, I really got tired of looking at really banal stuff that was just technique. And, 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 and it didn't, you know, I went to, I was, you know, art school trained and, and grew up in New York and went to galleries for days and art museums all over Europe. And, 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 and I came back to my community and that art was fulfilling for me. Uh, that was the art that nurtured me and create, you know, created in me what I make today. And so I have to give respect to those traditional artists because they created that vocabulary for me that I use. I think that's a very good note to end on, and I'd like all of us to thank our wonderful panel. It was really great. Thank you so much. Anyways, I was interested in the representation. Um, again, looking at, not so much looking out, but looking at the way um, people are looked at. And I started looking at these portraits, so-called portraits of, um, of native leaders. Most of these were painted when um, people were taken to Washington to sign treaties. Um, and they were often, you know, specially asked to put on their regalia or their most traditional outfits um, and were painted. Uh, the collection was, in the pro was the property of the War Department in those days. Um, and they usually had the person's name, but I realized that there was something like, this came out as a print series too, a print portfolio. There was something a lot like the Audubon's project, the Birds of America, which came out at the same time. Um, the same sort of feathers and exotic animal quality to it, um, and maybe a similar means of, of capturing the image. Um, Audubon used to hunt his birds and then prop them up in lifelike poses to paint them. Um, so I was interested in this whole, this whole sort of thing, and I just wondered what would happen if you actually took out the features, whether the portrait would collapse or not. Um, and in this one, um, there was a self-portrait uh, that, that the, um, the man had, he was wearing himself, his own, his own face paint. So I, I brought, tried to bring that forward. And, and something, another intervention, this is Sequoia, sort of Moses-like, carrying the, uh, the famous Cherokee uh, alphabet that he, that he um, a friend of mine, I asked a friend of mine who could actually uh, speak Cherokee, how you would say sort of get lost. <laughs> so he, he wrote that out on there for me. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, you can, sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize I had these. Next one, please. Next one. Yeah, and we, I had it made into a big banner. I was in a show um, with uh, Jimmy Durham in Madrid and uh, London in 1992, a, a, bi a biennial where we did a, 
uh, uh, performance and a whole series of things. Next slide, please. Um, I came back to New York, <laughs> and uh, I, had a, I had a project to do with a public art fund, and a whole lot different understanding of, of landscape that would, that would happen in this project. Uh, I was interested in a site, next, next uh, slide please. Um, this is, uh, that's the Civil Court building downtown, just below Canal Street, Center Street and Lafayette Streets over here. This is the site of a, of a former pond in, uh, in Colum well, in <laughs> for thousands of years until about 1811 when they filled it in. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a map where you can see the, um, you can see the, the previous landscape superimposed on the city grid, or perhaps the other way around, I should say. And that's the red square is sort of where we were in that photograph. But this was called the Kolk by the Dutch, or the Kolk by the English. It was a freshwater, deep freshwater pond, spring-fed. The springs that feed it are still there. They're being used to cool the criminal courts building's air conditioning system. Next slide, please. I did this sort of monument um, piece uh, on that site um, in the shape of the former pond. And I, was, uh, I had a residency out in Staten Island where there was a live pond. And I cast, um, I cast the sort of shores of that live pond along with a few other things to bring out the sort of, to talk about the collect and its disappearance. Next slide, please. I called this piece Earth's Eye. And it had a, Earth's Eye was taken from Walden. Um, Thoreau wrote um, a nice line about, about the pond being like Earth's Eye. Um, next slide, please. So these were all separate castings, um, all in this wedge shape that had, um, that had a legend going around the outside. Next slide, please. Um, this, was, uh, this was Snug Harbor Cultural Center, former Sailors Snug Harbor. Um, an 1830 uh, home for aged and uh, injured sailors on Staten Island. Uh, uh, actually, the, the result of the philanthropy of this man, um, Randall, who was a um, privateer and who had made a lot of money um, preying on British shipping during the American Revolution, he left his farm in Washington Square to be used as a, a home for sailors. Uh, by the time his family stopped fighting over the will. It was 1830. The land was too valuable to use that way. They started building the, you know, Washington Square sort of, um, you know, Russell Square-like park and, um, and houses around it. But anyways, next slide. Um, this is, this is um, a hyphen. That's a sort of a covered passageway between two buildings. This is the old main hall and the dining hall. And I did an installation in the windows of this passageway. Um, Next slide. Um, I was conscious during my time there that this had been a home for people with, um, with uh, I, I'm, I'm being told that I guess I'm, I'm out of time. Yeah. Um, um, anyways, well, if that's the case, then I'd like to go ahead, because um, I want to show you this. I want to talk about this one piece. You can keep going. Don't look at any of this. <laughs> See, I have no concept of time anymore after all these panels. I apologize. I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to divulge that. <laughs> This is the piece that was at, um, am I allowed to say that? This is the piece that was at the, uh, at the who's, who stole the, well, you can see who stole the TP show. Um, I made about 300 corn husk dolls, and there was a soundtrack of the Ganon yoke um, that was a collaboration with the Faith Keeper at Six Nations. Next slide, please. No, this was at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. What used to be called the Customs House downtown. Next slide, please. 
Okay, this is, this is the piece that I was telling you about, um, the one where I'd sailed up this urban creek. And um, I made a panorama. Actually, it was based on a 19th century form called the moving panorama, which was almost like it, it prefigured cinema in a lot of ways. Um, it consisted of uh, a tall canvas. Um, sometimes they claim miles of canvas. Uh, on which was painted, let's say, the, the banks of a, of a river. So there might be a moving panorama called uh, the Mississippi, uh, or a journey down the Mississippi. And this was very popular, especially in America in the 1840s and 50s. And um, uh, it represented a certain sort of worldview, I think, and a certain sort of desire for the virtual, a desire to be comfortable and sort of look at the exotic. So I took, um, I took this trip, uh, three mile, trip uh, down Newtown Creek, uh, which was called by the Lenape uh, Mespot, uh, Bad Water Place. Next, um, next slide. I wanted to see how it looked, you know, 350 years later. And, um, and I projected it onto um, a scrim of, of white turkey feathers that I, that I sewed. And um, there's a whole story in, in that and in, in how that came to be. But um, some other time. Next slide, please. Um, this, uh, this is a great aigrette. And um, uh, sh her nest is, is actually in the upper reaches of this creek, which is a heroic thing in itself. And um, uh, I surpri we surprised each other uh, one time when I was sort of scouting the location. And she showed up in the, um, this is toward the end of the video tape when uh, Toward, toward, toward the source of the, of the creek where um, it's a little bit more starting to come back, I guess. Next slide, please. This is just a, a, a closer, closer up thing. So you can see it's actually, in the end, it's sort of full circle. In the end, it's sort of a painting. And in the end, maybe it's, um, it's a lot like where I was starting out um, with the, maybe with the glow and the, and the stuff. But, um, that's all there's time for. Thank you. So looking for the hook. Anyway, our next, um, our next speaker is, and then of course the last, but not, but you know, we always save the best for last. So, um, so here we have her. Kay walking step. Why don't I just go one hand this way? Take your seat. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Isn't that a nice painting? That's not my painting. <laughs> I was, have been thinking about this idea of spirituality for the last week or so, trying to figure out how to talk about it. Uh, because, you know, I think we all sound like airheads if we talk about spirituality. Um, there is there's a sense that the intellectuals of New York uh, really think we're flatty-brained if we talk about spirituality. Um, in the 60s, or thereabouts, it was okay to talk about or, or to think of yourself as spiritual. It was, in fact, kind of cool. But to think of yourself as religious or to talk about religious was very uncool. And I think that that still is sort of in force. I think we still sort of think of it as kind of cool. Unless, of course, as I said, you're a New York intellectual. It's kind of cool to talk about spirituality. But it, it has a lot of pitfalls. Um, the first, of course, is the flabby brainness the problem. And the second is that there is this stereotype that all Native people are spiritual. And their, all of their art is spiritual. Well, it is true that Native people 
do have um, a history of great religions that train them to walk with God, but so does every other cultural group on the planet. So that I really think that there is this a problem in talking about native people, those of us here, um, as spiritual artists or using a spiritual aesthetic. Is our spiritual aesthetic any more spiritual than anyone else's? I really don't know. Uh, in 1989 um, or thereabouts, I came to realize that this painting, um, this painting of the dead Christ, represented to me a notion that had been taught to me as a child, that we are the corporeal, but we are also the incorporeal. Now, of course, as a kid, I really didn't know what anyone was talking about, but it was obvious to me when I saw this man A that he knew that somehow Christ is here becoming incorporeal. And when I saw this painting in this way, and I'd probably seen it a hundred times before that, of course, it permitted me to think about my own work in a slightly different way. I was working on paintings that had to do with the passing of time. Um, the uh, water, the cascades representing the uncontrollable passage of time, and the abstraction representing that which was stable or eternal. Next time. There's no way that I can see this. I hope you can see it. Uh, so I did a series of slides about the waterfalls. I was living then in Ithaca, New York, so that uh, there's a lot of waterfalls there. Next slide, please. And the abstract part was certainly representing the eternal. But what I realized, and I'd seen that Manet, I realized that there was a corporeality and an incorporeality that I was dealing with. The visual, the um, immediate reality that we deal with every day, and the reality beyond this reality. An eternal reality, if you will. So that these paintings were for me about this recognition of this truth that I've learned as a child. So I continued in this vein with other paintings. Um, this is called um, the Four Directions Spirit Vision, I believe. I did a whole series with similar names, so I get them all mixed up. It doesn't really matter a whole lot, I don't think. The four direction symbol that you see is a, uh, a really one of the few pan-Indian uh, symbols that I know of. Uh, native people, uh, there are something like 350 different languages in this country that are active today. There were probably many more uh, before the Colombian invasion. Uh, so that we're very different. I mean, different languages imply different cultures and different thought patterns and different all sorts of things. But there, there are things that we have in common. And this honoring the earth through the four directions is one of them. Next. Uh, this has, uh, this is called remnant of cataclysm. Took me a while to come up with that name just now. Brain is slowing down. <laughs> Next, this is a drawing. Here's another piece that uses the four directions symbols. And as I said, I think that these all have to do with that corporeal and incorporeal. And when I, I first started working uh, with diptychs, and this is not a true diptych, of course, but when I first started working with the diptychs, 
my notions about the diptychs were quite different. They were actually changed. Um, my husband passed away very suddenly, and I, of course that changes the way you think about everything. Uh, but I saw that painting, that Manet painting, shortly thereafter. And the, my whole view of what was going on in my paintings altered very much. This has um, the four direction symbol in two places. I don't know if you can see it on this side. It's rather hidden. This piece is actually has a home in Venice, Italy, which I think is very nice for the painting. <laughs> <laughs> this piece uh, is Havasu, Arizona. And I was using uh, copper, and this is um, like sculpt metal. It's actually bondo. It's, they use it on cars to fix <laughs> the, the bumps, you know, when it gets a hole in it or something. Um, so it's this very different kind of surface, so that the implication is that the, this other reality is different from this reality. But certainly as beautiful, uh, certainly as um, full, but both realities have beauty. These, this painting is relatively recent. It belongs to uh, the Munson William Proctor Institute in Utica. Um, I think it uh, was done about three years ago. It's called Dane in Arizona. And I have spent quite a bit of time in Italy. Thank you, God, you know. Uh, I spent a lot of time, and I have been very affected by the churches there and the use of gold leaf. And the gold leaf in those churches and in those wonderful um, 13, 12th, 13th, 14th century paintings, the gold usually indicates um, a heavenly space. It's not our real space. It's another space. It's a heavenly space. So I think that in my paintings, this gold represents that. It happens to be gorgeous also. So you know, there's, there's, that's perfectly good reason to use something, I think. And this is a meditating figure. Um, while in Ithaca, I, I actually meditated a lot. I belonged to a meditation group there. And uh, it's a very Ithaca thing to do. Uh, Ithaca and um, Boulder, Colorado, and Ann Arbor, Michigan, you know, <laughs> very similar towns. We all meditate a lot. But <laughs> this is, so next one. The, this is, um, I'm not sure this has much to do with spirituality. <laughs> You know, I, I tried to figure out what the, the spiritual really means to me. And it's, it's very, very hard to define. And I actually think that what I think of as spiritual is the Holy Spirit being within me and projecting from me. And I don't mean just the Holy Spirit in a Christian sense. I mean it in a much broader sense of that universal energy, that, um, that spirit that is beyond us, that eternal spirit that is within us. And I th certainly think that dancing is part of that wonderful eternal energy. Next. So I did a whole series of dancing figures and the truth is, I didn't think about all these things when I was doing the, the paintings. Uh, that's, um, the mountains are from um, northern Italy. It's uh, outside of uh, Fieta in the, um, the Prealpi is what it's called. And you'll notice the, the golden sky behind the Alps. More dancing figures. At one point, um, I don't know when, I realized that the, the mountains were really a stand-in for my own body. 
and when you see it that way, these take on a whole other meaning. <laughs> At least I think. The, I'm going to end with some paintings that I did in 1976, 77. You know, all the paintings that I've shown you certainly do have a, um, perhaps, perhaps a sense of the spiritual, at least spiritual idea. It is not, they are not paintings of the transcendent. When you think of the paintings of the transcendent, you think of Mark Rothko, right? Or someone like that. Abstraction. Because abstraction does have that quality of transcendence. You know that um, Torrance, when he wrote his book about the parflesh bags that the women painted, he said the women painted them because the women are closer to the cosmos. I've always loved that. But they have a transcendent quality, right? They transcend this momentary uh, existence. And I think abstraction has that power. And I think probably the most transcendent paintings I ever did were this, was this series of pieces um, called um, Amish to Chief Joseph. It was a, the Chief Joseph series. I did 36 variants on this two uh, small arcs, two large arcs in a rectangle with a painted frame. They are 20 inches high and 15 inches wide, and they are usually sh shown in groups of five or so. Um, I've always wanted to show the entire group together. I'm going to have an opportunity to do that. The National Museum of the American Indian, the old customs house downtown at Bowling Green, is going to have a show of my uh, work and I'm going to get a chance to show all of these pieces together as a big installation on one wall. So I'm very pleased about that. The whole show will be um, a show about seeking Chief Joseph. Um, it'll be abs uh, these abstractions as well as paintings of parflesh bags combined with landscape. Um, at any rate, for me, these pieces are the transcendent ones. These are the ones that hold some kind of spiritual aesthetic, even though I'm still not sure what that means. Thank you. I must say, Lorenzo has to uh, run off uh, a little bit early, so Got we'll have to say to catch, so like catch his bus. And, but are, are there any people here from the Bronx? No. Oh, well, that's good. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. I must say, if my, my sister-in-law is from the Bronx and she would be here, she'd say, but not for nothing, Dima, but you got a good-looking panel. <laughs> I must say, not only are we good-looking, but we're smart. So um, now at this point, uh, you're welcome to make comments, ask questions. We have until about uh, 10 o'clock. Is it all? Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, ask people who are asking questions to please stand up and uh, we'd like you on the videotape so that you can be asking your question and into the microphone so it will be recorded. Isabel, leave that one for the panelists and take a stand up. Hi, I, I prefer to sit, but I speak okay. quite loudly. No, sure. no it's recorded. Okay, but I have a question. Um, what, one of the things that I noticed. This is such a simple question. Um, one of the things that I noticed, I think, in at least three of your work is um, 
um, that there, there, there's a consistent pattern of having two things that are at least visually unrelated, but are put together. And, I, and as I was watching this, uh, the slides, I kept thinking, well, there are these two things that keep emerging in these paintings um, and sculptures. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to comment on that. I mean, it was particularly strong in your work, Kay. Mine is intentionally diptychs, that's why. Right, but I guess it seemed, no, I understand that, but, to, but it seemed to me like there was an, I don't know, like it was a whole, even though it was two separate things. Well, and I noticed point. it in Alex's, no, I, but. That, that, that I want it to be a whole. Take two disparate ideas, two disparate styles, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, right. and make a whole of that. Are you familiar with Lucy Lepard's book, yes. Mixed Blessings? Yes. There's a long uh, uh, essay on this whole idea of artists <coughs> of mixed blood who use uh, diptych formats. And it's certainly not intentionally that way, but um, I thought it was interesting that she handled it that way. Well, and, and actually, and I, as I was looking at it, I wasn't thinking of the Lucy Lepard essay, but I was wondering what your origin had to do with the fact that that was the kind of vocabulary that I was seeing. And maybe I've been going to too many panels, and I'm overthinking things. Um, but I just was struck by that, seeing that in, um, in three of your work. And the other question I had got answered. I wondered why this cruciform, which, what I was calling a crucifix shape, uh, uh, was that kept appearing. And now I understand that it's, it's a, a, an expression of some other, a different thing than what I would know. The reason that I use it is not just that it is a traditional native shape. I mean, the mm -hmm. four directions is a you know, traditional scene in the rugs and everything. Uh, but that it also uh, directly um, uh, applies to Christianity. And it also is a plus shape. This, there is more here. So that it has a lot of levels of meaning to, um, t to have meaning for uh, a wide audience. And I think that we all make art not just for Native people, we make it for everyone. My art is about the human condition. Uh, so that it's important that I use symbology that has to do with a wide range of people. Okay, thank you. We had another question. Some of us need to be enlightened uh, uh, um, about who Chief Joseph was and how these arcs that you represent represent a symbolism connected to Chief Joseph. And additional information might be helpful about the, what the four directions you just showed us, maybe I missed it somehow, what that represents in Native American culture. The um, two aspects, the... Um, I'll start with Chief Joseph. Thank you, please, whatever. Chief Joseph was a, a great American. Uh, he's a... Nez Perce, who um, tried to leave, he, he was forced to leave the Wallawa uh, mountains and valley uh, with his people, and he crossed Idaho from Oregon, uh, crossed the Bitterroot Mountains into Montana, um, went through Montana toward Canada. And um, he had 11 battles with the uh, United States Cavalry. There was 350 Nez Perce and 2,000 uh, uh, soldiers. He actually beat the pants off them three times. And he, he, had a, um, he lost one battle, and he tied one. So <laughs> he had a real good score but he finally surrendered. And it was a very tragic story and a very uh, touching story, and he's certainly one of the most brilliant people that have lived in the United States. And uh, so that this is an honor, this man. 
The arcs are simply arcs. What was the other question? More about the, uh, the four directions. The, the four north directions, north, north, east, south, and west. <laughs> I, I just thought that they may have they had to do with perhaps the earth and the sky and, and humanity. Well, I think it certainly is about the, the honoring the earth. In my work, um, the four directions is a, is, a, is a symbol for the, the terrestrial, and it represents the four directions, which is space. And we are children of space and time. So space is represented by the, f the number four, and three is represented by the, represents time. So we know that we are children of space and time. So that is, is a, a, you know, a visual, sort of uh, image that's very profound and uh, when you think about the two numbers and you, and you add them, they make seven and if you multiply them, they make 12. And if you're a student of numerology, you can have a real party. Mm -hmm. But um, there is, it, I use it in my work and obviously my, my pieces, it, I started painting those crosses and, and, and I just, they just took over and then my actual canvases became the crosses. But it's a really, um, it's a real important symbol, and, and for me, it represents the, the earth and space. They're not crucifixes, because crucifix is up high and has a long. There is the. Is the this like the equal, and also like in Jung talks about this, it's intellectual, uh, no, it's like the mind. They're just not crucifixes. They're, they're not crucifixes at all. The mind. They're, they, they're not crucifixes at all. If you've ever noticed in, in Western <coughs> tradition the crucifixes of Northern Europe resemble, to me they resemble swords. Mm -hmm. And the crucifixes in Southern Europe, the, the Greek churches are, are the, the crucifixes have the equal distance. Also the Celtic crosses are, are right. like a four direction, yeah. Yeah, but then of course they, they were tribal people and they were in touch with those things. Um, so. I've noticed that, and I've seen, um, you know, the collections of the, the, the papal collection, and they've had those kinds of crosses. But it was really noted to me that they kind of resemble swords. They're male crosses, and the, and, and the ones that are equal distant are the female ones, in my, my visual vocabulary. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I'd just like to say you were all wonderful. All the, Thank you. It was so wonderful to see you. Yeah. There's I'd someone. to see your work more. There's someone back from Kate's. Yes, is there any way we can find out more about individual shows for each of you where you'll be uh, exhibiting or, you know, um, where else we can see your work? Um. Well, as I said, um, my work's on exhibit at the gallery at the American Indian Community House until tomorrow. Um, if you'd like to see my work there, it's, that's the last day of the show. If you want to be on a mailing list, um, I'm sure that if you leave your name and address, Doug will share that with uh, all of us. And I'll make sure all the panelists get the names and addresses of all the people that, who would like to be on our mailing lists for, our li list for shows. You can see my work right now at the, um, the Armory on Park Avenue. There's a uh, Armory show. June Kelly carries my work, and she has a booth at the Armory. So that you can go see a couple of paintings of mine right now, if you wish. I think it closes Monday. Did you have a question? I'm going to be in a show in, uh, in Germany, in Frankfurt in May. And, um, uh, I'm also going to have a one-person show at the Woodland Cultural Center uh, in Brantford, Ontario, uh, right near Six Nations, uh, later this year. And currently, I have a show in London. So, anybody wants to go? Other countries appreciate the natives more than we do. There was mention earlier about the question why we do art. I, I, I'm an artist and I feel that the, 
I've, I've just recently moved here from the Pacific Northwest where I lived on an Indian reservation. And um, I've been somewhat dismayed and discouraged by the emphasis on selling and showing and getting up there rather than on the origins of art, which I feel you'll share that the origins of art being from spirit, whatever that means, from, from the earth, from not from the wish to excel or expose or win favor or um, gain prestige or fame. Not that those aren't all welcome, <laughs> but um, I'd like to ask you to address those um, inner urges you have and, w the, uh, and, and maybe uh, disclose some of the emotions or the feelings that overcome you in the process of your making your work. And I, I was very um, moved and excited by everything that I've seen, and I appreciate it. Well, I don't want to shatter anything, but um, I wouldn't want to shatter anybody's illusions, but uh, I definitely want to sell my work. <laughs> I have a lot of rent, <laughs> and um, I have a lot of responsibilities, and it costs a lot of money to make art. So if I don't sell it, I can't buy the supplies to make any more. I'm in the same position. I don't need to denigrate that. You know, and that's where it's at. But, but, but perhaps that's not the only reason for making the art. Well, you make art because you have to. Right. That's true. Thank you. That's okay. mm -hmm. Is there another question? Would you mind passing back on the mm -hmm. okay. No, I couldn't. I'm done. Oh. I, I've got a question. Um, I work at the National Museum of the American Indian, and, and one of the things um, I've noticed is people wanting to sec se separate some of the objects into sacred and profane, and, and I don't think we separate things quite that way. And, um, I think it's more integrated in our in our psyche. Like, you know, art didn't used to be, as my mom said, it didn't used to be a category. I mean, things were beautiful, but they were functional, and they were made with with such precision and such, um, you know, the celts and things at 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 the research branch are, you know, can any brancusi couldn't stand up to them, but they're not going to be considered fine art. But that doesn't mean necessarily that's our category. So. Just because it's not a Western category for sacred doesn't mean that spirituality wasn't infused within everything that, that we do. It's just more of a comment. Well, early on, you know, I said earlier that I was trained in the Western tradition. I went to school in Europe, and I went to all the great art museums of Europe. But there was something for me that was missing, you know. There was technique, there was um, material, there was composition. But for me, um, I had to come back home to who I was as an Indian person and re, you know, relearn um, who I was as an Indian person and, and then to kind of take those two worlds and bring them together because that's who I am. You know, I'm, I'm a person who who has uh, lived in New York all my life, pretty much, except for seven years where I lived out, you know, out west on the reservation in, in northern Minnesota. Um, but I had to, you know, I just, there was something missing for me. It just, it, and, and, and it still is, I mean. When I go to great art museums, I appreciate it, but it just doesn't touch my, it, it doesn't get inside of my gut. And it doesn't have that power that, is going, I, I think when you look at the work that a Native people are doing today, it's some of the most powerful work. Um, I, I mean, I, I really got tired of looking at really banal stuff that was just technique. And, 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 and it didn't, you know, I went to, I was, you know, art school trained and, and grew up in New York and went to galleries for days and art museums all over Europe. And, 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 and I came back to my community and that art was fulfilling for me. 
Uh, that was the art that nurtured me and create, you know, created in me what I make today. And so I have to give respect to those traditional artists because they created that vocabulary for me that I use. I think that's a very good note to end on, and I'd like all of us to thank our wonderful panel. It was really great. Thank you so much. And I think it, I think it would be a great idea for us to follow up with uh, a series on this. And uh, I also invite everybody to pick up an ATOA uh, flyer on the table on the way out and see what other, our other programs are. Thank you all. Is that mine? Yes, it is. Thank you. Oh, great. Great. Thank you. 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 My last name is Sword, and I keep looking around for little silver swords to wear on a necklace. Mm -hmm. And every time I wear them, a little hilt always has a crucifix, mm -hmm. and it annoys the crap out of me because I want to wear it as a little sword. And everybody's going, oh, I think it's I've been trying to do this for a couple of years already, so when you said that, I went, oh, that's funny.
of, uh, I need a copy of, I need four copies of that. You know, why don't I take it home and make a copy of an analogy of one of the kind of the, the thing we signed with all the artists. Oh, I see. I'll, I'll make a copy of it and sign it. I mean, make four copies of it, send it to them, and then send back the original. Take it and make copies and send it to us. see if we can just make copies. Yes, yeah. that's what I said. Let's have um, five copies, please. Sure. 